welcome to the Chronicles of Sigarnia, where we pair and review two of the best things in the world comprised of leaves, books, and cigars. Please only set fire to one of them. Today we have The Godfather by Mario Puzo and Don Pepin Garcia's JJ series in the sublime Toro size from my father. Someday I'm gonna pick a cigar with a short name. Let's just jump into this cigar because it's a 54 by six. It's kind of a monster. I don't know what I was thinking. Hmm, it's a sweet, almost grassy smell with a hint of caramel. Yum. All right, skirt. Right, here we go. Oh, watch this. Hey, <laughs> where did that go? Ah, okay, pre light draw. Oh, interesting. It's as if the aromas from the wrapper have switched. Where it was grassy with a hint of caramel, it's more sweet with a hint of grass. Huh. Interesting. All right, let's light this. So the My Father brand has a lot of interesting looking cigars, but this JJ series is evidently done in collaboration with his son, JJ. Um, and I thought that fit our theme of the book rather nicely. Ooh. Ah, and the world seems better. <laughs> Yay for cigars. Little bit of a ooh, stowaway there. A lot of pepper in that initial draw, but it is quickly overshadowed by some creaminess. Mm. All right, let's start with the book. Here we have The Godfather by Mario Puzo, and here he is smoking a cigar, which I thought was appropriate. So we not only have a monster of a cigar today, but we've also got a monster of a book, both because of the size, it's 430 something pages, but also culturally. It is huge. What I didn't realize until I was doing some research for a different book was that this is one of the best-selling books of all time. As of now, it's got over 120 million copies sold. Not only that, it was one of the fastest-selling books of all time with 5 million in the first year, which was 1969, by the way. 67 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> so before it was an epic film, it was an epic book. And my ignorant butt did not know this, so I thought it was about time that I read it and see what all the fuss was about. So if you don't know what this book is about, I don't know where you've been hiding, but considering there is a pandemic still going on out there, you kind of have a good thing going, you should go back to wherever you were and come out in about another two years and then we'll talk about the book again. But I will say that this is the Italian mafia story that started all of the cliches and the perceptions and the tropes that we have now today. Sentences from this book that were given to Marlon Brando in the movie were so legendary that they have become part of our collective cultural consciousness. And while Puzo never had ties with the mafia, the mafia since then has been influenced by his work. Okay, so let's talk about the first third of the cigar. It's very refined and almost clean tasting, and it is very smooth. Despite looking like um, a club that you can bash somebody over the head with, it is very mild um, and polite, I would say. The main flavor that's coming out for me is uh, a woodiness, maybe an oaky woodiness, but there is this wonderful ghost of sweetness that lingers on the palate after that flavor has gone. It's really nice, actually. I've had a nice even burn, if you can see that. It has stayed together for me, um, despite a lot of my gesturing. You can see that ash is a lovely light, almost white ash. Back to this book. So after the first few chapters, I was really reminded that this thing is from a totally different era. It does not read like a modern bestseller, which is so streamlined as far as plot goes. It's interesting because the stories are so present still that I forgot that this is over 50 years old. What I'm talking about specifically is how it jumps around from character to character, and it doesn't really stay and explore what is traditionally thought of as the main story of this, the story of Don Corleone. It's almost like it reads in concentric circles radiating out from the Don who is in the center holding the puppet strings as it shows on the cover. And it spends a lot of time 
in the heads of these periphery characters. And they're characters that you think, okay, they're gonna come back and have some really big influence on the main story of Vito Carleone and his sons. <laughs> they don't necessarily. You will be in some character's head that doesn't really affect the plot. But what that does is it creates a lovely overview of the extended family that the Don has created. And you can see how his influence radiates out throughout all of the people who, even if they're not directly connected and they don't see him every day, um, are really affected by his actions and decisions. So it is like the spider in the middle of that web or the puppet master pulling the strings. It's, it's a very cool effect, actually. So it's told in a really close, omniscient third. You are directly inside those characters' heads. You know everything they are thinking and feeling. And the result is that you empathize with these characters. This is great because they're not always characters that you would normally want to empathize with. People who might be murderers. And that empathy also makes you really care about these characters, which creates a wonderful tension because you know that that character you're starting to really feel something with might come to a sticky end and you're just like, no, I don't know. My favorite example of a seemingly random story is the one we get about Sonny Corleone's mistress. I suspect that a modern editor would have cut this because it doesn't seem to have any real bearing on the plot except for to provide some very juicy sex scenes. Oh my gosh, there's so much sex in this book. More than the romance novel that I reviewed. But it also gives you a pretty thorough dissertation on what can go wrong with female plumbing. <laughs> yeah, in this book. But it is interesting because you see how the godfather will pull some strings and somebody as far away from New York as in a gynecologist's office in Los Angeles can get some extra help. Okay, back to the cigar. It might look a little bit funny as far as construction. That is not the fault of the cigar. Someone may have dropped it. Anyway, so the second third, I'm finding a light charred flavor added to that woodiness, but also a lovely burnt sugar is starting to creep in and getting stronger as I'm going. It's occasionally creamy too. I'll get a hit of cream and then a hint of that burnt sugar and then a little bit of the char. It's actually quite complex and quite nice. Ooh, that smoke. Sweet, nice. I do like the coolness of these larger formats, but oh my goodness, I am about halfway through the cigar and it feels like I have smoked an entire cigar and a half already. The strength is really kicking in. Okay, back to this book. It's interesting to me that this book is really all about the human need for justice. That's what motivates all of this, and it's really what runs through all of the storylines. And it's how Vito Corleone establishes all of these ties with people. If you can't get it, he supplies it. And that's a really attractive thing. It's easy to forget when you have certain privileges and your life is good, that the miscarriage of justice is one of the most crushing human experiences. But if you've got someone like the Godfather, he can take care of it for you. I mean, it's so basic a human need. If you go back to Hamlet's to be or not to be speech, this is one of the reasons why he decides he doesn't want to be is because what he calls the law's delay or the lack of justice. And this book is oddly moral. Yes, the family does very bad things, but it's always to bring about that justice. Sure, they run gambling syndicates. Sure, there's a murder every once in a while, but it's always of people who deserve it. And interestingly enough, it's the characters around the Corleone family who turn out to be the truly evil ones and are the ones that the family are fighting against. You could always tell who the real bad guys are in the story because they're pedophiles and they get what's coming to them. So to sum up, if you're a fan of the movie, consider the book. It's not the smoothest read. It can be a little confusing because it jumps around in time, location, and into different characters' heads. But once you establish where you are, it's gripping. It blends a lot of the first and second film. And if you're tempted to say, oh, I've seen the movie, the ending with Kay is totally different. I love it. So one more note about the book. On page 18, we discover that Vito Corleone smokes a small machine-made cigar called the De Nobili. They are still available, and you can get them if you want to smoke along with The Godfather. One of my favorite bits is that Tom the lawyer, who is one of my favorite characters, is constantly trying to get Vito Corleone to smoke a better handmade Cuban cigar, and he keeps saying, no, I like my cigars. So 
I consider getting the de novelis for this episode, and then I thought I would take the advice of the lawyer. You always listen to the lawyer, right? Okay, final third of the cigar. All of those flavors have kind of blended into a smooth, creamy emptiness. And while that doesn't necessarily sound good, after this much cigar, it's almost a refreshing, nice way to end things, if that makes sense. It's almost as if that giant cigar is like setting you down gently. I've had to relight a couple of times, but overall, it's been a really consistent, good burn. Now, while I said it's winding down as far as flavor, it is not winding down as far as strength. And when I say it's putting you down gently, I might end up on the floor after this hour and 45 minutes of cigar, but I'm gonna be happy about it, so... <laughs> Make sure you eat something beforehand. Like I said, it is kind of a club that will beat you down um, in the nicest possible way. So as far as the fourth third of that cigar, the smoke does smell wonderfully sweet, like that burnt sugar um, that you have lingering on your palate, but oh my gosh, Yes, you are going to smell to high heaven. It really, it really lingers. <laughs> so just be aware that that is going on. So this is about $8, and for me it's clocking in at least an hour and 45 minutes. So it's gonna take you through about maybe six chapters of The Godfather, depending on how fast you read. So I think it's a pretty good value. Okay, so before I talk about next time, I wanna say thank you to my tasting panel. Thank you to the young man at Churchill Cigar Lounge in San Diego who recommended the cigar. Thank you so much to those of you who have subscribed. Please consider doing so if you haven't. Please pass me on to anyone who likes to read or might be interested in cigars. Most of all, thank you so, so much for watching. I really appreciate your encouragement and support. Okay, next week I'm gonna pull out something from a totally different genre that I have not done yet. You would normally find this book in the cookbook section, but actually it's a lot of in-depth history combined with both food and cocktail recipes. So I'm really excited to share that one with you. In the meantime, I hope you're smoking some good cigars. I hope you're reading some fun and interesting books. And ultimately, I hope you're doing them both at the same time. Thank you so, so much for watching. I'll see you again next time. Luca Brazzi sleeps with the fishes. Poor Luca Brazzi, he's just trying to do his job, man.